Hi students, this video is the last uh, video in my series of videos on constructing moral arguments. In this video I'm going to talk about constructing analogical arguments. Um, I think analogical arguments are really important and interesting kinds of arguments, uh, and so I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about them. I think some of the strongest arguments we'll be looking at this semester are analogical arguments. Um, analogical arguments can be really convincing and really powerful. Um, they're hard to respond to, um, and so uh, that's a reason to use them if we, if we can. Um, that being said, like principled arguments are probably a little bit more easy to, to generate, but they're also easier to refute. So um, a good analogical argument can be, can be really uh, a great thing, useful thing, and so uh, it's worth thinking about how can we come up with them, how can we make them. All right, uh, to start, let's just give an example of what an analogical argument looks like. So here's an example. Uh, premise one says that scanning library books is morally permissible. That sounds right. You know, if you go to the library and you scan the book, they're not going to bother you at all. They're, they seem to think that that's fine. Premise two says scanning library books is morally equivalent to illegally downloading textbooks. Ooh, interesting. So scanning library books is morally on a par with illegally downloading textbooks from the internet. Now, uh, the interesting thing that's going on here, right, is that we said that scanning library books is fine, and now we see that scanning library books is on a par with illegally downloading textbooks. What do we infer from that? Well, what, what can we infer, right? What we can infer is that illegally downloading textbooks is morally fine, just like scanning library books. So uh, if it'd be okay to scan a book from the library, that's permissible, then downloading it from the internet seems like it must be permissible too. It just is a faster, easier way to do it. So that argument is pretty good. Like I remember when I first read this argument uh, in a philosophy paper, I was like, wow, that, you know, that's a hard, that's hard to argue with. I think going into reading it, I thought, you know, no, you shouldn't illegally download textbooks. It's wrong. But, um, but now I'm not so sure. So, um, as I say here, right, this kind of argument is an analogical argument. Why is it an analogical argument? Because it relies on the truth of an analogy. So premise two, uh, this analogy, the moral equivalence claim uh, between scanning library books and illegally downloading textbooks, um, that analogy is crucial. It's at the heart of the argument. That's why we're calling these arguments analogical arguments. Um, they have the following structure. So um, this one in particular, right, starts out saying this act or act type A1 has a certain moral property being permissible. Premise two says act or act type one is equivalent to some other act, act type two. And from those two premises, we can infer, conclude that act or act type two has that same moral property that act type one had, that is M. So, um, you know, just to run through this up here, right? We have some act has a moral property. That same act is equivalent to another act, act two. Therefore, act two has that moral property too. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, one thing I want to note is that we can reorganize these premises in a certain way so as to do the same thing, but um, but just look a little bit different. So I'm going to give you another argument. Um, this argument starts with the moral equivalence claim, illegally downloading textbooks is equivalent to scanning library books. Illegally downloading textbooks is equivalent to scanning library books. Okay. Premise two says scanning library books is morally permissible. So we've got, we start with the equivalence, then we go to like, well, one of these acts is permissible. Conclusion, therefore the other act is permissible as well. So same kind of argument. I've just sort of changed how the premises look a little bit. 
but it's the same thing going on. Like this kind of argument, again, analogical argument, elementary the analogy, it has really it has the same structure, but um, again, we're just sort of manipulating things a bit. So premise one says some act is morally equivalent to another. Premise two says uh, one of those acts has a moral property. That means the other act has that same moral property as well. Again, same kind of argument. What I've changed is just sort of what that leading, that first premise is saying. Is it appealing to a moral equivalence? Is it appealing to the permissibility or, or wrongness or some moral feature of a certain act? Now, the reason this is important is because I think it, it kind of matters um, which of these premises you start with. And we'll see that a little bit as we, we practice. Um, the symbolization for these, I, I, I'm going to go through sort of both. So um, we might start out with this thought that like, we know what some acts moral property is. So say we think, you know, I'm going to argue that illegally downloading a textbook is permissible. Um, we might then go to like, oh, well, like, what's a something analogous? We might think about it, say, well, note that scanning library books is permissible and scanning library books is equal to uh, illegally downloading textbooks. So there you go. Um, if we want to think about like, how does this argument kind of work? Uh, it starts out with this premise that there's this action that has a moral property. And then it has a premise that says that action is equal to this other action, A2, they're the same. And so if A1 had the property, then action two has that property as well. That's kind of how the argument's going there. Starting with the fact that A1 has the property, going to the conclusion that A2 has the same property as well. How do we get there? through the equivalence claim. Now there's another, you know, the other way that we, we did it. Um, we started with the equivalence and then um, we said ac uh, action number two has this moral property. And we concluded that action number one has that moral property uh, as well. So if we uh, write that out, we might start, oh, well, A1 and A2 are equal and A2 has this moral property, and if we have uh, this equivalence relationship and A2 has this property, we can sort of like cut out the middleman as we did uh, with the principal arguments. So um, just two different ways of thinking about analogical arguments. Um, neither is better than the other in a way they're the, they really are the same, um, but just two different ways of thinking about it, if, if that's helpful for you. All right, if we go to our step-by-step -step instructions, um, we might start by identifying the conclusion for which we're arguing. So if we know our conclusion, we say, okay, I know what that is, now I'm gonna go look for an analogy. Um, again, I think this is less than ideal, right? Ideally, I think, and I'll show you this in the examples, ideally we would start with an analogy. We would say, you know what? Um, study, you know, downloading illegal textbooks, what's it like? You know, what's something that's equivalent to that? Um, what's a good, uh, something that's, that's similar? And then once we have the analogy, we just figure out, well, what, what's, what can we say about that other thing? Is that permissible? Is it wrong? So I think that the more intellectually honest way is to sort of start with the analogy and just see where that takes us. But, you know, I realize we're going to have conclusions that we think are right and we might start want to you know want to start with those so that, that's okay um, if we identify the conclusion the next thing to do figure out sort of why we believe that conclusion and in an analogical argument this is going to involve identifying some other act that's morally equivalent to the act in question so after that we put what we have into standard form we symbolize it we identify the argument's implicit premise and we write that premise in and then uh, finally, you know, uh, we, want, we maybe try and strengthen the argument by modifying the premises. Um, in an analogical argument, this might often involve, um, you know, changing the analogy. You know, what exact, is it 
really analogous to this, or is there a way I can tweak the analogy to make it more similar to this other thing? Um, oftentimes, analogies and analogical arguments get used in conjunction with some sort of uh, thought experiment or story. So we say, imagine, you know, Jim goes into the library and he finds this textbook and he scans all the pages. Um, now imagine uh, his brother finds that same book on the internet and downloads it illegally. You know, it seems like there's no moral difference. Um, so figuring out, well, can we tweak the example or the thought experiment, or the analogy some, some way? That's how we might improve these analogical arguments. Okay, so as far as practice goes, um, I'm going to give you this question. Are immigration restrictions morally justifiable? So are we justified in restricting immigration? As I did in the last video, you know, I'd encourage you pause this, try, try your hand at coming up with an analogical argument here. What's a good analogy? Um, you know, what's your conclusion, right? Maybe try and come up with an analogical argument for both conclusions. Uh, on the one hand, right, the conclusion that immigration restrictions are justifiable. Uh, on the other hand, maybe try and come up with an analogical argument uh, that immigration restrictions are not morally justifiable. When you're done, play, see how you do. Okay, so again, start laying out premise one, premise two, conclusion. What's the conclusion we're going to argue for? Well, this first one, um, we're going to argue for the conclusion that immigration restrictions are not morally justifiable. So you might think, why think that they're not? You know, what analogy could we come up with to get the conclusion that immigration restrictions are not justifiable? And so one analogy that occurs to me uh, here is that we might think that immigration restrictions are equivalent to segregation laws. So um, especially when we think about immigration restrictions on our southern border, we might think it's a way of sort of keeping uh, Mexicans, Hispanics out of the United States. It's a kind of segregation uh, going on here. You stay uh, in Mexico, it's separate but equal. Uh, if we if we symbolize that, we get you know immigration restrictions a one equivalent to segregation laws. Conclusion: We're going to try and get the conclusion that that action a one immigration restrictions are not morally justifiable. So what's the missing premise? Well, the missing premise is uh, A2, action 2, segregation laws, are have property M. They're not morally justifiable. So that's A2, arrow M. And so that's what we would include in the argument. Segregation laws are not morally justifiable. Now, say I want to argue for the opposite conclusion. Say I want to argue that immigration restrictions are morally justifiable. What kind of argument am I going to come up with here? Um, again, I might want to think about well, what's the analogy that I'm going to use. Um, I think it's intuitive. If you start with a conclusion, it might be it might be good to to put the analogy in premise one. Um, but if you know what your analogy is going to be, and you know how you're going to argue. You you don't have to put the analogy in premise one. Sometimes actually leading someone through the argument um, by starting with the, the thing that's supposed to be analogous is a way to sort of surprise them when you point out the analogy. So for example, if I was arguing for this conclusion, maybe I start by saying something like, well, trespassing laws are morally justifiable. So, you know, it seems fine to want to keep people off your property. At this point, we want to symbolize what we've got. So here I say, I'm saying action one has a moral property M. Now trespassing laws, you might think that's not really an action. Well, just think like passing the laws against trespassing, um, that's kind of the action. And passing those laws would be more morally justifiable. So we can think about it in that way. Uh, the conclusion, if we want to symbolize that, it's this other action, uh, immigration restrictions. Are morally justifiable. Action two has property M. So then the question is, well, what premise are we missing? What's the thing that's not there? And uh, that is, as you know, action one is morally equivalent to action two. Okay, so now we just need to fill that in. What's action one? 
Oh, action one is the trespassing laws, morally equivalent to what's action two, immigration restrictions. So premise two would be trespassing laws are morally equivalent to immigration restrictions. And this argument, I think, um, when put in this way, can be kind of a bit more persuasive and kind of catch people a little bit more off guard, right? If you point out like, hey, trespassing laws, we all think those are fine. And you say, but now look, that they're really morally equivalent to immigration restrictions. Well, then you sort of, the sort of, um, your opponent, you know, the person you're trying to argue with is caught a bit off guard, right? They're like, yeah, I was on board, trespassing law seems fine. But now you sort of put the burden on them to figure out well, what's the morally relevant difference between these two things. So um, that's one way that uh, an analogical argument might go. Hopefully this is helpful, and again, we'll be practicing some of this in class, uh, but this is just to give you a sense for how to go through the process. All right, see you later.